We fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Ne aşağı, ne ne fazla, ne and have feelings that, that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. Get a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Varm Blog. And today I'm here with uh, Ben Burgess. And we are talking about the uh, legacy of the late Christopher Hitchens, who's been gone now nay a decade um uh which i realized when i was looking through your book i was like oh yeah he's been dead a while um and he's an interesting person to me because for someone who even towards the end of his life had a lot of uh cultural clout um he kind of completely disappeared from the discourse for a while. I mean, uh, I mean, I think that with him, the, the reasons are a little bit more obvious than with other people. But would you like to talk about why you think that happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So uh, the book came out a few months ago on the 10 year anniversary of his death. And uh, and it is true. I mean, there is there is like a pretty big disconnect if you think about how um kind of omnipresent he was the last few years of his life um that uh you know in the discourse that um you know that he you know he faded away from it like much more than you'd think right like so there's um you know i mean even if you look at like books before mine you know that had uh that had been written about the guy you know there's just not very many right there's richard seymour's uh, book on Hitched, uh, which is uh, which is a very straightforward kind of left takedown of Hitchens uh, from uh, from Verso, and there's uh, Larry Totten's uh, book um, Faith for Hitchens, which is uh, a very weird book. I talk about in mine. You know, Totten is a uh, intellect is an evangelical uh, apologist, uh, and there's not much else that's like solely about him which is actually yeah as you say it's kind of a shocking disconnect so uh why is that well i guess there are probably a few reasons uh and maybe the biggest and most obvious is just that the fact that he was so omnipresent in the last few years especially uh has to do with two things right one is the cultural purchase of like you know new atheism back then uh, which he was, you know, one of the most prominent figures of, uh, and the other, you know, has, has to do with like the politics of, you know, the war on terror and both of, you know, and, and so like, if you look at like his appearances on Fox news, um, you know, they, they loved him on the, the war on terror stuff and kind of used him as a whipping boy and the atheism stuff and, you know, had him on for both reasons. And in both cases, I think it I think it makes sense that somebody uh, who, because that last phase of his life, right, the sort of Iraq and debates about God phase, is is when he became the most prominent. I think it makes sense that as both of those things kind of faded away out of public consciousness, that um, that he would become you know much less part of the discourse than you would expect from somebody who is you know recently dead uh, and uh, and was you know, quite that prominent in the last years. Yeah. I think the other thing that kind of interests me about Hitch is um, around the writing of Hitch 22 and, and mortality, mm. he starts to question a lot of the positions that he had during the war on terror. And 
he's also interestingly, you know, famous for like, you know, the God is not great book and, and what, and what else, but of the new atheist, he's actually, uh, rhetorically the most aggressive, but, uh, epistemologically, uh, not the least, but the second least. I mean, him and Dennett are about equal. Mm -hmm. Like he, he actually does talk about other forms of irrationality other than religion. And I mean, that book has a kind of, I think funny and somewhat lazy chapter about Trotskyism in it, but, um, God is not great. Yeah. God is not great. Um, Oh, Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Okay, yep. yeah, yeah. You just think about the, the. There's a chapter where he equates his uh, his time in the, the 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 SWP with being in a church. Um, but he yeah. is he is more nuanced actually on the religion on the religious question uh, than than say either Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins, um, despite being a virulent atheist, um, and. He's also incredibly meanly witty, mm-hmm. which I think led people to think he was more virulent than he was. Um, you know, another thing that he's interested in, it's interesting to me on is people think he was a Zionist, which. No, it's totally wrong. Yeah, it's just not true. Um, despite yeah, no, his I mean, association with neoconservatism. Totally right. I mean, this is the, I mean, I kind of make a joke in the book about, you know, there's the sort of cliche about the person who's a pep, right. Who's uh, progressive except for Palestine. And, you know, in, in a weird way, he was, he was sort of the opposite. Although, you know, honestly, that wasn't his only deviation from neoconservatism, but it's, it's one of the most important ones, right. That the, uh, that like, he was like a neocon except for Palestine, that, although also really, a, really, we should say a neocon except for Palestine torture and surveillance, at which point, you might wonder how much of a neocon he is, you know, like he'd certainly, he'd certainly converge with them on some really important subjects and taken, you know, what I see as like catastrophically bad positions, you know, on, on foreign policy in the last in a decade of his life, which is, you know, a big, a big part of the purpose of the book, you know, it's like, is to um, try to figure out like, okay, what, what happened there, right? You know, like like one of the the chapter titles literally called "What the Hell Happened." Um, but yeah, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't. You know, he really wasn't a Zionist. I think he was like, I think he was more moderate on that at the end than he'd been before. But he never like got to the point of being like an apologist. You know, for uh, for Israeli policy towards the uh, the Palestinians. You know, I mean, like he he maybe went from being like a super hardcore anti-Zionist to like maybe a two-state solution would be okay but you know you can see him like on C-SPAN um arguing you know with uh Andrew Sullivan in this like wonderful clip where they start out uh, agree you know they start out agreed with Iraq about Iraq and then um a caller I think like a Japanese guy calls in and is like okay so you, you keep on talking about all these UN resolutions that uh Saddam Hussein has violated well what about you know, all the UN resolutions that Israel violates and the United States gives them cover and Hitchens basically says, yeah, good point. Um, that, that, that's bad. That's a problem. And, you know, he, he links it into his current, like awful sort of overall, you know, foreign policy positions. Cause this like, you know, undermines the credibility of the, you know, project to liberate Iraq, but, um, it then leads to Hitchens and Sullivan like having this pretty nasty argument because because Sullivan, you know, sees what Hitchens is saying as like um, not being willing to take sides against terrorists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating that that's not one of the things that changes. Another thing you brought up was the stance on torture. He mm-hmm. he famously defended waterboarding for a while, then. I will give him credit for this. Uh, underwent it and immediately recanted his position. Like, right. um, which even at the time, and I, at the time I was, I, I think that this would have been yeah. in my my own political like gray period. Um, I respected actually as a oh well he admitted he was wrong about that even though, I mean. To me, it was yeah. obvious it was torture. But in general, he was also a critic of the black sites. Um, and 
one wonders one wonders what drove that. I think the first thing for me was the amount of pushback he got mm -hmm. uh, criticizing the Clintons um, on the kind of liberal left in the 1990s. And, and would you like to talk about that? Because I sure. think, I think that, I think his book on the Clintons is still probably one of the best books. <laughs> So. Yeah, hard to agree. I, I think, uh, yeah, no one left to lie to the values of the worst family or depending on which edition you're looking at, no one left to lie to the triangulations of uh, William Jefferson Clinton. Uh, yeah, I think it's a fantastic book. I think that actually might be my favorite Hitchens book, but uh, for for a few reasons, right? One of, one of which is that even though, um, you know, he was theoretically committed to, you know, to socialism, you know, for three quarters of his career uh it's the you know it's the only um out of his out of his you know his books um out of the books at least right you know, it's the uh it's it's the one where there's the most like passion about um you know about poverty and economic inequality you know within the uh, within the united states um like there's some really savage stuff about welfare reform uh in uh in that book um, there's some very good stuff about healthcare, you know, in the, uh, in the book. Uh, and, you know, there are criticisms you could make of, you know, of his stance even then, but like, I think that, um, but I think it's a book that like any contemporary leftist reader who, who picked up would, would like, right. I mean, it's, it's, you know, they'd, they'd be, uh, you know, they'd be into it. Uh, they'd be very surprised when they got to the Iraq chapter, because even in 1999, uh, you know the the you know the line on Iraq, you know, it was like already pretty clear, you know, where he was going to end up on that. Um, but uh, but other than that, right? It's it's a book. Uh, it's a book any contemporary leftist would like. And I think that it is maybe worth taking a beat to think about because this is a one area in which things have maybe changed, you know, for. Uh, you know, for the better that in, um, I think in the nineties being in sort of, you know, there wasn't really left media at all in the sense that there is now, right. You know, like that there wasn't, and I think couldn't have been, you know, something like, you know, Jacobin or current affairs, like or even like, air America radio. Like, <laughs> that's like true. That. That's true. That's true. There, was, there couldn't even be that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I think, I think just, there wasn't just, really political space for that being like a meaningful thing with a big, you know, big audience. Uh, so, you know, about the closest you had was, uh, was something like the nation where Hitchens, you know, worked for, for many years, but you know, the nation, you know, it still is now in many ways, right. You know, and it would, certainly was then in this kind of gray space between um, just standard American liberalism and something more robustly left wing. And so, you know, it's a place where you could have people uh, like Hitchens or like Alexander Coburn who were always criticizing, you know, standard American liberalism for the left. But I think also, like, just even before we get into, like, some of the specific things that Hitchens did that particularly pissed liberals off uh, in the 90s, I think just visibly, loudly hating the Clintons uh, in the 90s was a really tough position to take within any kind of even vaguely liberal adjacent, uh, you know, political space. I mean, like, I think probably actually more so like if, like if people think about like how, uh, the sort of like pushback that like, you know, I don't know, Glenn Greenwald was getting in 2010, you know, for, for hating Obama. Right. You know, like, I think it's like that, but more so, um, you know, that cause, because it's just a political environment where there's just no hint of like any, you know, like that's, that's sort of the furthest left that people could imagine real politics uh, get in is just like Democrats win it instead of Republicans win it. And so I think in that, uh, in that context, you know, that was a, that was a pretty hard position to take. And, you know, and, and Hitchens was always out there reminding people about, um, you know, Bill Clinton flying back to Arkansas during the 1992 uh, campaign to preside over 
uh, the uh, the execution of of uh, Ricky Ray Rector, as a uh, who was at that point like profoundly mentally disabled, uh, and you know, and, and that's stuff that people didn't want to think about because they were they're feeling defensive about Clinton because you know they, you know, they did the thing that liberals do where they're sort of like emotionally bond with you know with with whoever the right is like attacking all the time um and then especially i mean i didn't get into this in the book because it just didn't fit but like uh especially uh when uh when hitchens like really crosses the line in in the eyes of um you know left liberal media people by uh, by by testifying, uh, you know, by by you know, giving testimony, uh, like giving a deposition, I guess, uh, to uh, to the the Ken, you know, the Ken Starr investigation, uh, because Sidney Blumenthal, uh, <laughs> who is the uh, uh, the the father of Max Blumenthal, which is hilarious, yep. which uh, is a great irony of the universe. But yeah. <laughs> it is, yes. <laughs> I uh, was somebody who was like a Clinton administration person who was like socially, you know, friendly with, with Hitchens. And, uh, at the time, and, uh, basically, you know, Clinton said, Oh, I never told anybody to, you know, to smear Monica Lewinsky. And Hitchens was like, well, what, like hell you didn't. Right. You know, my, my buddy, you know, Sidney Blumenthal came to me with this like dossier of like stuff to, you know, smear Monica Lewinsky that he was shopping around. Uh, and he gave this deposition about it. Which, um, you know, I think it's complicated. I think it would read a little bit differently in the post Me Too era. But like, I think at the time, most liberals reacted to that as if he named names to McCarthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a uh, it's a fascinating time period to think about because I remember um, how many people turned on. Uh, even Monica Lewinsky about this. Mm-hmm. I mean, you think about some, some, uh, some interfeminist debates from the time where they were basically shouted down. Um, it's, I think it's hard to put it in contextualization now because we do have a, a robust Clinton. I mean, well, center of the democratic party, skeptical media, and it existed in the nineties, but it was in zines like, and, yeah. and occasionally in Noam Chomsky interviews, but then again, Chomsky would always, you know, remind us to go vote for sure. the Democrat um, at the time. And I, I don't, I, yeah, think... I, I remember how big Chomsky interviews were even in the early two thousands. I mean, I'll, I'll, I would go out and buy, like with with like one of those like tiny like tiny little booklets of like mm-hmm. anthologized Chomsky interviews came out. I'd like go out and buy that. I was excited, you know, because it's like, uh, you know, you you got so little, you know, lefty, you know, commentary and anything that was even you know, at that level of prominence. That yeah, I mean, it was it was a it was a it was a totally totally dismal landscape. I mean, like I guess you had like I'd you know counterpunch when it was like an actual like newsletter, or, like possibly photocopied or something. Yeah, Counterpunch was one step above a zine. Um, and let's see what else. There was there was alternative press media, but that was that was sporadic on what it, on what the positions were. I mean, you you might read criticism of Clinton, you might meet weird articles between uh with Murray Bookchin and uh Bob Black arguing <laughs> because that's what that milieu was. And uh you, you might read uh what's his face the native uh oh um he kind of got disappeared for for overstating his indigenous heritage um war churchill yeah war churchill uh yep. yeah that would be in there and yeah you killed for chomsky as you review because it wasn't weird sectarian <laughs> uh nonsense basically i mean um and you know i i found all this very uh, very a turnoff at the time um and uh i you know I, but i was i was moving rightward during the early aughts and then coming out of it during the mid aughts um and what i found interesting my own trajectory is like 
I kind of had the brothers Hitchens in my head. Mm -hmm. Like it was a debate between them that was always going on. Um, And another thing I find interesting about Hitchens, the end of Hitchens career is he wrote a series of books defending uh, key figures. He wrote one defending Orwell, which I think is actually decent. Mm -hmm. Uh, He wrote one. I think it's too long, but it's good. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. The joke I was made is like that, that, would have been much better off and been published by zero book. So it would, it would have had to cut out a bunch of the chapters uh, that were like talking about some not very well remembered, probably for good reasons, Orwell novels and, um, and, and just kind of focus on the essential stuff. Cause I think there's a very good book in there. It would be my take on the Orwell book. Yeah. My, my, my take on it is it either needed to be shorter, like you said, or needed to be longer because they needed a lot more contextualization. It either mm. needed to be scholarly or not. Right. Um, uh, but but I do think it's an interesting book. I think the Thomas Paine book is also interesting. Um, the Jefferson book, I know that our cultural context for talking about Thomas Jefferson has completely shifted since Hitch mm-hmm. died. Um, which I, I think also, I mean, yes, we knew about the Sally Hemings stuff even back then. And yes, sure. it was becoming more controversial but I don't think like the idea of Je- of invoking Jefferson in particular would have been as problematic as it is now. I actually find that book somewhat interesting, um, yeah. even though it's not really about politics. It's more about Jefferson's like deism. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Which which there's also a bit about Thomas Paine book. I mean, I, I will say I mean I think that to my mind the thing that's like. Um, you know, like the thing that should really make people reevaluate Jefferson is not even so much the Sally Hammond stuff. Cause I mean, that's kind of focused on like, you know, cause like if that's what you're talking about, right. You're sort of focusing on the way that I think very often uh, Jefferson and slavery has been framed, which is this sort of personal failing, right. That they right. have that like, you know, he will, you know, he, he wasn't, uh, you know, I don't know. He didn't have the strength of cause you know, convictions to free his slaves, whatever. But like, really, I think the stuff, and this is, not like something that came out at a certain point. This is just the historical record. People have always known this, but I mean, like the stuff that I I would think would be much more significant as far as that goes is like the actual, um, like, you know, when he was president and, uh, and the, the, you know, and, and he was, uh, and he was cutting off revolutionary Haiti because, you know, because, because he was worried about the example spreading to the American South. Right. I mean, which, which Mm -hmm. I think like, you know, usefully reframes it as like not primarily a matter of like lack of personal virtue as much as like he's he's like actually, you know, acting as a political representative of the planter class. I mean, that's the interesting thing about Jefferson is actually Jefferson's political career is often not discussed by either detractors or defenders. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it is an abstract in the beginning, but the policies of his presidency are remarkably under discussed. Um, uh, similarly, actually, with like John Adams, who personally mm-hmm. is is much better on on things uh, revolving slavery, but politically was absolutely not. So, mm-hmm. like, um, it's it's a very it's the American discourse around the, the founding fathers is, is very skewed, and I think unfortunately Hitch didn't no. didn't do much about that. What I what I think is interesting though is that those three figures are telling. Mm -hmm. because they're figures that are claimed with some legitimacy um, by both the American left and the American right. Orwell is, uh, is probably the, the, the hardest claim, although his role in anti-communism is important. Um, It's mostly posthumous, but it's important. Uh Um, The blacklist scandal aside, uh, yeah, which which I will which I will say I I think um, hit you know I think Hitchens makes a fair fair case that that's uh, overstated. Like I think that there's I think that there's like a real thing there, but it's like the real thing is that um, is that like the sort of underlying thing is that he had basically thrown in with the West in the Cold War, right? I mean, like that's mm-hmm. that's that's true and important and something that he should be criticized for. But also, I think once you really start hearing about the details of that, like, is that really, um, you know, 
like it's 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 not really uh like name and name so people can be blacklisted and, you know like like this is more like um here's this you know it's some kind of like british equivalent of some kind of like congress for cultural freedom kind of bullshit and uh and like somebody who was like running it like was like basically asking him for suggestions of people they should or shouldn't you know invite to be part of it and um and so you know he's kind of saying like on the basis you know like 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 i don't even think he's particularly divulging probably you know public information you know uh private information uh you know when uh when he's doing that i think it's more just kind of like no this person's like too much of a fellow traveler to like invite to do this thing so it's like not quite like testifying to huac or getting people you know blacklisted from hollywood or something like that but it is you know i mean the real thing is that he had definitely you know orwell had definitely by that point given up on anything like third positionism i mean you know he was he was just you know he was just on the western side yeah so yeah, he'd given up on third campism and, uh, you know, I, I consider him, he, he, it's an interesting thing because I'm like, I feel like he pays more of a price than that than say Ella Kazan does for, <laughs> for testifying at HUAC. Um, but he's also dead. So I guess it's easy. Um, and his books were so much of the anti-communist curriculum, even though weirdly they don't make sense unless you hold certain um yeah I, I mean the most the most uh the most famous like the most amazing example of of this is uh the was it like the signet edition of animal farm might be mm -hmm. 1984 i think it's animal farm it has like in the introduction so it's like you know whatever sold like however many million copies uh you know it's like the standard edition uh and the introduction you know whoever wrote the introduction quotes uh orwell's essay uh why i write uh, and uh, and they, they quote, you know, where he says since 1936, you know, Orwell's in, in Spain, uh, his, uh, you know, his experiences in Spain since 1936, every, you know, serious line I've written has uh, has been directed towards the struggle against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism. And like in the introduction, it cuts off the end for democratic socialism. Yeah. I mean, it gets it gets that that uh, that blatant. It's. It's fascinating because Hitch's selection of those figures, and it's interesting that those books also are positive cases where mm, his mm -hmm. 90s books and his early odds books are all negative cases. The Trial of Henry Kissinger, The Missionary Position, which is probably, I mean, which I think people underestimate because actually Hitch's position on Mata Teresa is now common. It was heretical on like almost every level um when it was released like liberals did not like that book either um which is strange for me now because basically the cultural discourse has actually caught up to christopher hitchens on on that yeah yeah to a point i mean i think that like people still i don't know maybe it's just that i do because i'm old but like i have a like like i'll like i i'm sure there are cases where like i've even been like reaching for an example of like selfless saintliness and you know and and i've used the phrase like mother Teresa that i remember yeah yeah well yeah but i think that's still probably true but it's right. also you know there's the the kind of people who would read the nation now probably mm -hmm. agree mm -hmm. with hitchens but that was not the case when that book came out um K kissinger hatred probably was the least sure. controversial of, the, uh, of those three books um it's 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 amazing to me. Um, I think the other thing, though, is that we have to look at the way that new atheism went almost immediately after Hitchens' death. And, and I think that uh, also informs things. What do you mm. make of that? Like, what do you make mm -hmm. of the strange trajectory of new atheism? Um, yeah, I guess the first thing I would say is that my sense, and I don't, you know, it's not like I have numbers on this, right? You know, so this is all just kind of squishy and anecdotal. But my sense of this is that there isn't like a trajectory of new atheism, really. Uh, there are, you know, there are like a, basically it's more that the sort of cultural moment in which new atheism makes sense ended 
And then uh, because of that, a bunch of people who uh, who were sort of together do a went to a lot of different directions, some of which are pretty strange, right? Which I think is what you're getting at. But like, uh, you know, but I mean, I think that, cer- again, certainly anecdotally, like I know plenty of people who are, you know, big new atheist four horsemen fans in like 2009 who are like, you know, Jackman readers now, right? Like that's, that's actually not a super right. uncommon trajectory. Uh, but uh, there is also, um, you know, and, and certainly within the four horsemen themselves, right? I mean, there's the, uh, you know, Hitchens obviously dead, uh, dead it largely just sort of quietly returned to, you know, doing the academic stuff he'd always been doing. Like, you know, like he, he got, I mean, he was always the least sort of splashy one anyway, but, you know, he got less visible. Uh, Dawkins, I guess, is the one who is the closest to just sort of continuing, you know, in the vein that he, he was at. Uh, and, like, you know, and he certainly will, like, you know, say and tweet things that could only be described as cringeworthy, but I think that his sort of core interests uh, probably haven't changed that much. But, I mean, Harris is the most interesting case because he became a charter member of the IDW, um, and there's like a super interesting question about what Hitchens would have thought about all of that. You know, it's hard to know, but, um, you know, I have thoughts cause it's hard not to play that parlor game, but you know, I, I don't know. Um, I've, I've always actually been surprised that it took people so long to call Harris out on his politics um, uh, because they've been consistent actually. <laughs> like, like when I was associated with the, with the, skeptics movement in the mid aughts uh coming out of being a a paleo conservative but i was an atheist even back then um i'm probably honestly more religious now um the the uh the entire milieu was was interesting hitchens work was not what i was concerned about even though i opposed him on the iraq war Mm -hmm. um I was more viscerally concerned about uh, about the arguments of Sam Harris because he made arguments about like preemptive strike uh, based on religious probability, which I thought was like absurd, um, uh, yeah. and particular, you know, and, and stuff like that, which Hitchens never did. I mean, like, and this is not to clean up Hitchens's. Sure, of Hitchens' course. mistakes, like, but it, it is something that I was always fascinated by because even at the time, Hitchens paid far more of a price to it than Harris did until he officially joined the IDW. Like, yeah, um, I mean, I, I mean, Hitchens had been a leftist. I think that's the, I think that's the big, you know, the big distinction. I mean, nobody could really feel very betrayed by by Harris having bad politics because you know because he he had them when he came on the scene. You know that, uh, uh, but I mean, I. And, you know, and I also think that, like, and also, I mean, I, you know, to be fair, I mean, if we're all going to do a complete survey here, you know, I think we also all know there are plenty of people who are, like, you know, rank and file new atheists in uh, 2009 who ended up in places like even stranger than, you know, more safer than Sam Harris, right? Like, um, oh, yeah, the, Pat Condal, if we're going to name names, like, um, yeah. uh, I mean, the weird I mean, thing about not, not that he was really part of it back then, he was kind of a Johnny Johnny come lately, but James Lindsay. Yeah, James Lindsay. Um uh I think uh Michael Shermer, but Michael Shermer's politics were always right wing. Um uh but the you know I, unfortunately it sort of ruined one of my favorite magazines in the aughts. I love Skeptic Mag, it was my favorite of those ma- magazines in the aught teens, it like made me want to vomit. Mm-hmm. Um, and while my yeah. politics changed, so did it. Like, yeah. like the one thing about early Skeptic Mag is it is, and again, not to defend it, but Shermer didn't bring his politics into it. Um, yeah, that, I actually remember reading a book, Shermer's book, uh, Why People Believe Weird Things in the Early 2000s. And there's like one line in there, like, like I think literally there's like a sentence in the book where he. Mm-hmm. You know, where he like, because he, he actually has a chapter about, you know, uh, why objectivism is a cult. Uh, and, um, and, but like also in the chapter, he, he, he sort of does this little side, like, I actually basically agree with Ayn Rand about everything. And yet. Right. Yeah. 
um, he, he, he would, you would get it out of him occasionally. I mean, and the new atheist movement was politically quite diverse, even at the time. I mean, Penn and mm-hmm. Teller were diehard libertarians, um, and, and, and this, that, and the other. I mean, um, I think, I think Hitchens got it out of a sense of betrayal. And I also think, unfortunately, or fortunately in the new atheist movement, um, because of its almost unitary focus on religion and because when that fell out, some public figures went in a bunch of different ways. Like I said, Pat Condal got associated with, with like the, uh, Bre- with the most racist ends of Brexit. Um, uh, James Lindsay, it's James Lindsay. Mm-hmm. Um, but you also have the fact that, you know, I think most, most new atheists are pretty much standard issue Democrats. I mean, like, mm-hmm. and they were in the aughts and they remain so. And I, I would actually critique a lot of their politics, but it would be, sure. it's me critiquing a liberal. It's not me critiquing a neoconservative or a white nationalist. Like, but- totally. Like, 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 I think this, this definitely conforms with my impressions. Uh, and, and I often think that like the, that, for some weird, for some reason, I, I'm not sure why. Uh, maybe some, of, maybe some of it's reading back from some of the, play, you know, from the fact that some new atheists became weird right wingers later. But like, uh, cer- you know, a lot of the left seems to remember new atheism as like primarily about strident Islamophobia, and I actually don't think that's right. I think that there was certainly. And in saying that, I don't want to suggest that there wasn't Islamophobia in the mix. There certainly was, right? You know, but um, but I don't think that was like the primary, um, you know, wellspring, right, of uh, of new atheism. You know, I, I think that it was just kind of like, yeah, uh, war on terror era America. You know, there was like Islamophobia, you know, sort of bursting out of every seam. You know, and so of course, you know, of course it was it was present there and they were going to have their version of it. But I don't think that was the main thing that was going on. I mean, I think that the main thing that was going on and the reason why it stopped existing when it stopped existing is that, you know, new, I mean, yeah, I know there were like libertarians who were new atheists and, you know, I know there were neocons who were new atheists, but certainly anecdotally, everybody I knew who was into new atheism was just a regular liberal. And like my strong impression you know, and like, it's not a quit, right? I mean, like, I don't know, like Family Guy uh, had an episode where Brian meets one of his girlfriends because they're like both reaching for uh, the God delusion at the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Barnes Noble at the same time. And like, not coincidentally, that was also the character who would, you know, they'd have like scenes where he's like, you know, sipping a martini and reading the New York Times. Like, I like Hillary Clinton, you know? Like, so that's, that's the, you know, I, I think that was the cultural vibe of it. And I think it, um, I think it makes sense because I think that the main, you know, new atheism made sense because the culture war in the late 2000s was just about religion in a much bigger way uh, than than it is now. And, and even despite stuff like, uh, you know, some of the like crazy socially conservative developments on the American right lately, like the culture war in the United States, in the late two thousands was about religion to an extent that it's almost hard to remember now. Like, or it's almost hard to wrap your head around. Like, I think that the overall vibe of of uh, contemporary conservatism is is just much more secular. Uh, you know, even though the evangelicals are still the most reliable voting base for the GOP, even though you know uh, Trump right was certainly appointed judges who would do all the stuff the evangelicals wanted him to do, right? Like. Like the the presentation of it is much more is much more secular. Whereas, and I think that like the kind of liberal response to that, you know, accordingly has shifted. Right, like your average sort of pretty militant liberal now, um, the sort of like the really dark suspicion they have about um, about conservatives is mostly revolves around thinking that they're racist. Uh, and in the late 2000s, they might have also thought they were racist then, but that wasn't really the main event, right? The main event was that they thought they were like theocrats who were going to, you know, yeah, the, bad the, ab- the whole abortion. dominionist scare, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Which, which is, and I remember C Street and all that. I mean, and what is interesting is a lot of that stuff is real, 
but mm-hmm. the the statement and focus was extremely different. Um, I actually remember arguing with people that like George Bush was not a dominionist Christian, like that you should hate him for other reasons, like, mm-hmm. um, and people thinking I was nuts. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, this is this is right. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of my take on. Uh, on, on Donald Trump, you know, that I don't actually, uh, um, I don't actually think, I mean, you know, maybe in a certain sense, but I mean, in terms of like, in terms of like political goals that he was like realistically striving to achieve, right. I don't really think Trump was a fascist. Uh, I, I, I think he's, I just think he's a Republican, right. You know, which is bad enough, right. You know, that it's like, it's like, yeah, the, the, the bad stuff that you should mostly worry about with Trump is he's going to, uh, you know, bust unions and deregulate everything and, you know, like do, do all the, you know, do all the regular Reaganite, you know, Republican stuff, you know, appoint, uh, appoint social conservatives to the Supreme court, you know, I mean, all of that, you know, but, but it's like by and large, it's mostly, you know, with some instability and more obvious criminality around the edges, it's mostly the shit that Mitt Romney would have done. So, um, I think one thing we have to deal with, though, with Hitchens' role in this is Hitchens often is used as like this great example of all this. But, but one thing that I think we are are left with, and, and your book actually does go into this in the last chapters, is trying to make sense of what would have happened right. if Hitchens had not died right before the tenor of left wing politics actually moved back in a socialist direction after Occupy Wall Street. He dies, you know, a year before that, basically. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and so we don't know what his positions would have become. Um, and it's, it's, I think that's, that's interesting. I also think the, uh, the observations that you make about the secularization of America here now and also in the book is interesting because that has more or less happened. And one of my arguments is even like evangelicals and the way they act now is as politically concentrated as they are now and, and condensed and, and even racialized as they are now, that's actually a result in my mind of secularization. Like they, Mm -hmm. like they were a, they were actually a more politically and racially diverse coalition when there was more of them and Mm -hmm. uh, their beliefs were mostly religious and from, from actions from the John Birch society in the seventies on forward uh, through the moral majority period into, you know, the Bush years. um, It really seems like what you had was a winnowing away of anybody who was involved with that for non-political reasons. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, and I I think that's interesting too, because one of the things I remember that people would throw at Hitchens all the time is like, America was never going to be a highly secular society. We were not like Europe. We were exceptional in that we we were highly developed and remained religious. Although, you know, with a high GD coefficient, probably not helping much. And, uh, that really hasn't been the case. Um, and, and even with high levels of professed religiosity in the United States, uh, nobody in larger numbers goes to church. That you like, that's actually you know one of one of the, the, the strange ironies is even in places that still are nominally very Christian, where people will profess on pupils to be believers, uh, church attendance has plummeted um, yeah. before COVID, and it's probably way worse now. Um, uh, so. I think what what I think is interesting though is this does this lead us to the question yeah. uh, um, how much was new atheism driving a cultural change like it thought it was, and how much was it just an already like a fait accompli of cultural change itself? Yeah. Um I think probably mostly the second one. I mean, I think that the that I mean, what? So one thing that you know, I mean, I was thinking about with the book, and like, you know, one reason I, I did want to write it, you know, is is because um, I, you know, I do find uh, the, you know, I like, 
you know, I do find the religious stuff interesting. Um, and, you know, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, in a way where like, you know, I, I kind of complained about this a little bit in the last chapter that there's a sort of like weird, like too for cool for school thing that I find among people who do left media where there's this, this sort of profess to be completely indifferent to it. It's like, I, I don't, I don't know how much I believe that. Right. But like, uh, but yeah, I think that, uh, I think that America had in many ways probably become a uh, pretty second, you know, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I think America in many ways was extremely secularized. I think it sort of had to be probably for, uh, for new atheism to arise in the way that it did. Right. Because it was, um, you know, because, I, I, you know, I mean, again, it's, 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 uh, it's culture war stuff on, you know, ultimately, right. Like you had to have like a really big, well-defined, thoroughly secular tribe, right. You know, in order for, for new atheism to, uh, to take root, you know, in, uh, in the way that it, uh, in the way that it did, right. To be, to be an expression of, you know, like the, the deepest blue, you know, part of the, uh, of the American, um, you know, the American cultural political struggle and, uh, in the, uh, in the way that it was. Right. So, uh, and I mean, I think that said, I mean, again, I was thinking about this was writing the book. I think that it is still, you know, like the thing I always, think about is that okay like there's tons of stuff about new atheism i'd be very critical of um in fact it calls itself new atheism but i suspect it's a differentiated itself from socialist atheism to be honest that's one of them but yeah it, yeah for sure right uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh which right um absolutely yeah i mean i i, I and i and like also you know which is funny too because you think about it, it's like okay realistically you know which is, um, you know, which which force has done more to like spread like to really go to the particular obsession of that era, right? I mean, which which force has done more to spread atheism like to the Middle East specifically to the Muslim world, right? Like like capital C communism, or mm -hmm. like you know Arabic translations of Richard Dawkins. I think we know the answer, you know. But yeah, pretty clear. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so so I'm certainly very critical of that. I also think related to that. Uh, I, you know, I'm very, you know, I think a lot of it's tied into a, you know, idealist view of history, which, um, is something I give Hitchens a hard time about in the book, you know, since, since he, you know, claimed, uh, to, uh, to, to, to still subscribe to some version of historical materialism, you know, to, to the bitter end, you know, but I mean, I think there's a pretty big contradiction there. Uh, between that and and the sort of degree of causal importance that he seems to have assigned to, um, you know, religious belief per se, you know, in uh, in history, so I'd certainly be very critical of that. Uh, the fact that you know a lot of it was, even if I don't think it was the main thing that motivated, a lot of it was very tied up in you know war on terror, uh, uh, paranoia about you know um, about militant Islam, all of that stuff. But I also think like. There are a lot of people who I do think benefited in a certain way from it, right? I mean, I think if I think if you were like, um, you know, if if you like grew up in a, you know, super evangelical kind of household, um, you know, and you know, I think that seeing people sort of publicly criticize the things that you were wrestling with, whether they really made sense to you. Um, seeing people defend the idea publicly that, you know, you're not a bad person, you know, for, uh, for not believing this stuff. I mean, I think that, you know, I think that that did have, I think that did have value. I think that had value for people I know. Uh, and, you know, all, which, I mean, I think in a way it's, it's just, a uh, you know, I, I think it's, I think in a lot of ways, like the conclusion that I would take from it is like, and look, it's not that like, you know, public atheism is uh is a bad thing you know I, I i think that's i think that's probably a niche that you know that that should be uh you know filled by somebody i'd just rather it be you know i'd just rather it be filled by somebody who um you know for whom it wasn't attached to all of those things right you know like like in other words that you know that it doesn't i'd like to 
I mean, in a pretty, you know, maybe in a slightly simple minded way, you know, like I would like to make a pretty sharp differentiation for the most part, uh, you know, between religion and politics. I mean, this is why, you know, whenever something comes up, when I'm like in a position, you know, like argue with somebody about religion in some way, right? Like, which, which I'll, you know, a couple times I've agreed to do is like a, you know, I'm just going to like do a thing where I argue with somebody about religion or like there are other things like the Charlie Kirk thing where it'll, it'll like come up in a certain part of it. Like I'm always pretty scrupulous about starting off by saying, look, um, I like the Christian left, right? I mean, like I, and you know, and I'll, I'll sort of name check, you know, whatever Cornell West and, you know, to a couple other people and to make sure people really believe me, I'll throw in my wife, you know, who's also in that category, you know, like, um, cause, cause I, I don't think it's useful to, I mean, like it just, one of the things that seems silliest to me about new atheism in retrospect is this idea that it's like a movement, you know, that you, that you're like on the, you're like manning the barricades with people. And it's like, no, I mean, look, uh, I have, uh, you know, my, my beliefs about metaphysics might be closer to, you know, Michael Shermer than Cordell West, but I know who I see as more of a political ally. Yeah, it was it was quite strange to me. I remember and PC Myers is actually one of the in the late aughts, uh, was one of the big proponents of this. And in 2017, uh just said he was just an atheist to, to, to distance himself from this uh, prior writing. But the whole like movement language of like uh we can't handle religious accommodationism uh from from some parts of the new atheists like yeah. like we should be talking we should be targeting religious moderates and the religious left as well because they are enablers and, and and this dialogue always confused me because part of it was taken from the civil rights movement in a way that didn't really make sense and part of it was even taken from like nationalist movements in a way that didn't even make sense and i don't even think that people doing it realized that they mm -hmm. were doing um cuz i'm like so are we advocating for atheist separatism? Um, <laughs> are we advocating advocating for enforced secularism? Because one of the things that that I actually one of my early disagreements with the new atheists um, what was over, I think Dawkins calling religious indoctrination child abuse, and I'm like, well, then right. almost by that logic, any teaching of kids any ideology is child abuse. Um, uh, and it is, it also assumes a totally individualistic view of child formation. Um, mm -hmm. But I see what he was getting at. But then I, I started thinking about it and I was like, in forced secularization, uh, in the, yeah, this, in the US this is start, the point. Yeah. Yes, uh, Peter Hitchens makes in uh, The Rage Against God that you have, uh, that's like really take that seriously, right? I mean, it's like, okay, so something's child abuse. Right. Then, then, uh, and look, I, look, I mean, I could even, you know, I'm like half sympathetic to the point that, you know, that there's something fucked up about, you know, uh, telling kids to worry about going to hell forever. But like, really take that seriously. If something's child abuse, then like, you should be like, then, okay, how, like, we don't tolerate child abuse, nor should we, right? I mean, we would be like calling like child protective services on people, you know, at which point you're talking about a pretty authoritarian society. Well, yeah, and this is this is this was my point that I used to try to make to people about this, even when I was not a Marxist yet, was like look at the Soviet the post-Soviet spaces in Czechoslovakia, where they actually had a strong atheist educational system, but it wasn't seen as like culturally necessary to suppress the church quite as much as it was say in Poland or or in Russia itself um the atheism of the Soviet Union stuck in the post Soviet period but in Russia itself and Poland where the repression was more direct uh i think people have overstated how religious Poland and Russia are but you have to admit that there has yeah. been a pretty big rollback of the secularization. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's clearly a big, like clearly, uh, clearly enough of the population of Russia is religious enough that the, the Putin regime sees it as advantageous to like be like ostentatiously allied with the Orthodox church. Right. And occasionally do weird things like, uh, you know, um, 
decriminalize spousal abuse uh, at the behest of the Orthodox Church, et cetera, and so forth. I mean, stuff that's right. uh, very hard to defend from a secular lens. Um, uh, and I think uh, I think that's that is something I used to actually, and I was throwing this at them in like 2009, 2010, and this was when I was becoming, you know, the, mm. the fire breathing Marxist I am now. But uh, it what it was partially in response to these, like this, uh, the other thing that we forget about new atheism, because man was this popular for a while and then fell off of cliffs around 2011, 2012. You remember memetics, not memes as we use them now, although this is where the term's from, mm -hmm. but this idea that like the ideas is, yeah. yeah, function like a virus. Uh, yeah. And I remember thinking like, this is purely idealistic. Like it seems to be uh a scientific way of thinking because it, it 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 is an analogy to biology but it's only analogous and right. uh also like totally ignores sociology and and you know uh, a bunch of other <laughs> fields of study and i mean it did it did go away i will admit that like the scientific community actually corrected for it fairly quickly mm -hmm. um memetic sort of fell out of the discourse even fell out of atheist discourse uh I, I'd probably say by 2014. Um, mm -hmm. But there was a period where, like, that was huge. Um, and, you know, I think that, I think Hitchens is interesting because we don't know his response to all that. And I don't think we can know, particularly because of the weird ambivalence of his late writing. Like, there, I, I, when I read Mortality and Hitch 22, he 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 seems to be less. I mean, he's still, you know, a, a rhetorically assertive and biting, but he seems to be less assured of a lot of his conclusions than he did even a few years before. And so, I don't know what we would have got with him. And I, I, I liked your book for letting us wrestle with that, mm -hmm. you know, because you know I love Richard Seymour. Um, I do. And some of the critiques he makes uh, in Unhitched is, are absolutely sound, but some of them he, I, I've never thought were totally fair. Um, he, yeah, I mean, he does. Uh, he actually had a Substack post uh, back in, was like November or something, uh, you know, where he was, I mean, he had he had read my book, but he was saying it was about to come out and like he was sort of reflected back on Unhitched and he was saying that like, you know, basically that he, you know, he thinks, you know, like, you know, he thinks that the criticisms were right and all that stuff, but, uh, but that the, uh, it was like probably more prosecutorial in tone than it should have been and that the, it would have benefited from, from wearing its ambivalence, uh, on its face a little bit more. Cause he said he, he wrote it, you know, out of, uh, you know, out of, uh, you know, I mean, it came out having very mixed feelings about, you know, about the guy, uh, which, uh, which is, which is certainly where mine came out of, uh, that like one of the, you know, I mean, I wanted to, I wanted to write it for a few reasons. One of which I already indicated is that I think, you know, is that I think that, um, I wanted to deal with the question of what happened to him and like why he, he drifted to the right in the ways that he did in, because I found standard lefty accounts of that deeply unsatisfying, um, you know, the, which, you know, cause I think people were basically just too mad about it at the time to like, you know, think more ad analytically about his trajectory. Uh, so I wanted to do that. I wanted to, um, I wanted to, you know, to grapple with some of the religious stuff. I wanted to reintroduce, you know, choose or really just introduce uh, contemporary lefty readers to all the stuff that he wrote before, you know, the period where he was all over YouTube. Uh, but I also, you know, more than anything, I mean, in some ways it's like kind of the most self-indulgent thing I've written. Cause like, you know, really I wanted to write about Hitchens because, you know, I thought that, okay, like the 10 year anniversary of his death was like a, a good excuse to do it. Right. You know, but like really more than anything, just cause like he's somebody I've always been like really interested in and always had extremely mixed feelings about, you know, that I wanted to like kind of work through a little bit, you know, and, uh, and think about why I found him so interesting, what was good and bad about him. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I think that what Hitch, where Hitchens would have ended up, uh, 
given beating cancer in 2011. On some level, I have no idea. I think there are some things that you could like rule out pretty confidently. Uh, like, you know, I don't think there's any version of him that would have, you know, been like his brother and become COE. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, definitely not that, which is, <laughs> is funny. I, I actually saw, I, I did a, so I was at this, uh, uh, this festival in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, Wales over the weekend. And, uh, and I did like this, like breakfast discussion thing about the Hitchens book and just before I went to it. So I, so I like quoted it at, at the thing. Uh, I saw what I thought was like the platonic ideal of a Peter Hitchens tweet, which was, uh, Peter Hitchens retweeting himself being mad about the metric system. It's like, uh, it's like, yep, there, there's, there's the man in, in one tweet. Um, but, uh, but no, I, I don't think he's any version of him that would have become religious. I also don't think there's any version of him that would have like been sympathetic to, to like Trump or Brexit or any of that stuff. Right. You know, I think, I think that like that you can safely rule out. I think that the things that that leaves ruled in is a really wide range. Yeah. Right. Like, like be anything from, a Sandinista, uh, a standardista to like Lincoln uh, Project, to Lincoln Project, and anywhere in between, and we we don't know. I mean, right. I, yeah. like I think that's um, right. yeah. the the late the late books to me. I, there is something interesting though. There's an observation um, in your book that I found interesting in the Chomsky Hitchens debates in particular. And I, these debates, I actually do remember reading when mm-hmm. they happened. Um, which which is not true for a lot of the early '90s stuff because you and I are old, but we're not that old. Right. Um, but the, I do remember reading the end of the of the Chomsky Hitchens debate and feeling very ambivalent because there were things that both of them pointed out that that have set with me for a long time, and the thing that Hitchens pointed out that I think is true. Uh. That that uh, that since the fall of the Soviet Union, particularly in the time period we are discussing, um, uh, the the nature of anti imperialism as expressed on on the global scale wasn't left wing. It wasn't even trying to code itself right. as left wing. This was the yeah. the period of jihad versus Mac world. If people <laughs> think about it, like that terrible book that came out around the same time. Yeah. Um, and Chomsky, uh, for all the other things he's right about, and he is right about the way in which like some of this religious extremism was actually prompted by colonialism, uh, through discrediting secular, uh, powers. And particularly in like the case of Palestine, that was even policy to discredit the PLO so that things like Hamas would, would become more, uh, predominant because Hamas was easier to scare people with um, of the discrediting of um, of uh, progressive uh, Arab nationalism uh, during the Nasser period um, it, you know the 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 the, the binds that the various uh, Middle Eastern communist parties increasingly got in and, and that you know frankly um, Western intellectuals like, say, Foucault had no idea how to navigate and really took stupid positions on. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, I think about Foucault and the Iranian Revolution and not seeing that the you know they were going to slaughter their allies very soon. Um, the the thing that I take away from this is that. Hitchens to me, and you can you, you can uh, go back and forth on this. And Chomsky himself, actually, in a lot of ways, are kind of symptomatic of that time period where the Cold War is over, mm-hmm. but we don't know how to orient ourselves anymore. Um, there is, I mean, like, and I, I think it's also easy to forget yeah. this oh, after right. Occupy. Yeah. Like, like I, I remember when Tyt in the aughts seemed like the most progressive thing on air. Mm-hmm. And it was not at all by, right. by today's standards. I mean, even by its own standards now. Right. Um, yep. uh, it's, 
it's hard to put ourselves back in that mind frame where like no one's talking about class. Mm-hmm. Uh, even race is a little bit weird about being talked about explicitly in this time period. It, it begins to around 2006, six, seven. Um, and everything seems to be about really about a religious culture war mm-hmm. that really ha- had been playing out from say 1992 through 2004, 2005. Um, and, I do think in that time period, the left seems particularly lost. It doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know what to do with the Democrats. It doesn't know what to do with new labor who, you know, loses. It doesn't know it, it, it's lost. And the war, oh, on, yeah. the war on terror, it doesn't, I mean, like, yes, most people took anti-imperial positions, but I think people, Forget, for example, like the the debates between, say, Samir Amin and Talal Assad, which which was like people accusing Samir Amin of basically, you know, the Maoist guy who wrote the book, literally wrote the book on Eurocentrism, of being too Eurocentric for arguing that Arabs could be secular, right? Um, and that that secularization was not just crypto Christianity creeping in, right? And um, while we've seen some of that kind of discourse try to come back in the last five or six years, it has not in the way on on the progressive left or the academic left in the way it was at the time. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we forget that a lot. Like, I, like I'm, I'm like, go back and read Burso books even from like 2002. They are radically different. Like, um, we're still talking about Derrida, Specters, and Marx, and like if whether or not secularism is inherently racist. And admittedly, I do admit, like stuff like there are French, and there are still French stunts. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is about the French in particular where this comes up a lot. It's a particular form of laicism that where it seems like secularism is kind of code for Christian. But sure. um, in general, yeah, uh, it's I think it's hard. To do that, and what I found interesting about your book is like it puts into perspective how quickly our cultural memory lapses, even in a time period where we had the internet. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And I, I, I do, uh, and I am, I am somebody who, who very, uh, very firmly thinks that the, um, you know, there aren't a lot of things that are better about the United States than uh, than France, but there are a few. And uh, and that's one of them, right? You know, that, our secularism that, is is is, is uh, well, uh, with yeah, with but, this but, 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 of court rulings aside, are is actually like yeah. very much secular in the sense that there's just a dividing line. It is not an enforcement of right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Which you know, which I actually think is a much better. Um, you know, which I actually think is like a much better bet in the, uh, in the long term anyway, for, uh, for, for getting less intensely religious, um, you know, populations, even though obviously, you know, I know the thing that you can point to as a counter is like, no, but the United States was, you know, the most religious, you know, nation in the you know developed world, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, I also think, um, you know, I, I think that like kind of leaving people alone, and then also um, also meeting their material needs in a better way than the uh, the United States uh, the United States has um, you know I mean I I think ultimately you know if you want people to uh, you know to grow up and to be in a good position to live their lives how they want to live it and and, and just kind of relax about the whole subject uh, that's that's probably a better bet but uh, but yeah I, I don't know I think. Um, yeah, I think the left was really bad at that at that time. I mean, I can certainly remember, um, like you you didn't. Um, I mean, it was weird. Like, I think, like my sense of it is that, like in like the late '90s, when like as a teenager, I first started to get into this stuff, mm-hmm. is that like, you know, I don't know. I mean the you know, like the platypus line, you know, felt, felt more true than, you know, than, uh, than it ever has. Right. That's just dead. Right. You know, not, not even exactly for the reasons they meant, but like that, that they're just, that there's just kind of nothing, you know, it's like, it's, it's like a few, uh, 
you know, like if you're on a college campus, you know, like there'd be like a few eccentric socialist groups running around, but that was, that was kind of the, um, the extent yeah. of it. Right. Um, there'd be a few Trotsky's groups and one or two Maoist groups and like, well, not, no, even the DSA would have been tiny. I mean, like no, yeah, the DSA was, was essentially a mailing list, like in yeah. most, in most places at that time. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. So, and then, like in the early two thousands, uh, yeah, end of the nineties, early two thousands, you started having something in a certain way, but it was very not socialist branded at all. Because um, Randall was part of the anti-war movement, really. I mean, yeah, that was where the left debates were on. I, I, I also think people like forget how nastily sectarian. Uh, even though we weren't fighting about anarchism versus communism or any of that, actually, like, right. um, it was like whether or not you sided with Susan Sontag or, or Chomsky or whomever, you know, the, the figure was, um, and I also think people forget how the academic, like, yes, there is a spectrum of postmodernism that people use. I, I like that sure. cool book, uh, you know, that, that like equates critical race theory and standpoint epistemology with, po with post-structuralism, which is like not even true. Right. But, um, but there really was a sense in which like, okay, the most radical thing on the table at the time was like Derrida, which is no, very to weird. Totally. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean like you had, yeah. I mean like you had like at the time, I mean, I was, I was pretty active in, uh, in the anti-war movement in the, mm -hmm. you know, 2002, 2003, 2004. Um, and, you know, being around that, being around, like, the Green Party, which is, like, where a lot of, like, socialists were, just because that's, you know, that, that like, felt like, oh, well, what, what exists that has some sort of, like, energy to it that's, like, outside of the mainstream. Uh, and, it, like, you know, there was a lot of sort of vague anti-corporate politics, but, like, in this way that was not yeah. really didn't really center um... ad busters no logo stuff um <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Alter, that, i mean yeah. the 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 anti and alter globalization movement which did have some both yeah. anarchist and 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 communist like uh, uh core to it but it was also weird but because like like that was how i was exposed to pat buchanan like was actually right? <laughs> that and that got me eventually over the course of that and like the shenanigans of international answer. Uh, uh, so, so, so I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, I yeah. don't know if I've ever, I've ever told you this. I did uh, in 2000 and what would that have been? 2004, 2005. Um, mm -hmm. I, um, uh, I actually saw, saw this happen and bailed out. Uh, bailed my friend who did it, or you know, help bail him out of uh, of jail after he did it. Uh, there's a, a good friend of mine back then who uh, who was arrested for um, uh, attacking Pat Buchanan because uh, the uh, the like Young Republicans or whatever the organization was on campus had brought him in uh, uh, to speak, and it was uh, Caesar Chavez Day, so he doused him with Caesar salad dressing, but. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, but yeah, no, it, it's it's like that. There is a lot of like uh, I, I mean, look, I th I think that some of what I think you maybe you were getting at with the original question is that I think some of what Hitchens was reacting to is that what anti-imperialism existed in this time period um, was it really in many cases, right? It's complicated because it was and it wasn't, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think about Tark Carlson being everyone's favorite, every every liberal's favorite yeah. conservative because he was anti-Iraq war in 2005. And, and like, that, I, I people, I think they literally don't believe me when I say that, but that was not false. Like, um, uh, I, I, you know, I knew a lot of liberals in the anti-war movement who read Amcom magazine and didn't realize it's politics. And, and, and people like me at the time were getting pulled into that politics because that's what looked like, um, that that's what, you know, yeah, uh, I read, a, I read a couple issues of American conservative back then. Like and I occasionally was... made good points even, but sure. it was for another purpose. Like, and the purpose was, Pat Buchanan's <laughs> politics. So, yeah, know. no, totally right. So, I think there's a lot of 
uh, I, I mean, some of it's just like a symptom of the general ideological retreat since the seventies, right? Since like mm-hmm. in the, like, look, the anti-war movement that somebody like Hitchens knew at, at like Oxford during Vietnam, uh, was, was like very wrapped up in like real serious left politics because, uh, because real serious left politics was just much more prominent, right. Than in, uh, you know, whatever, 1972 than 2002. Uh, and that was, had gone very, very thoroughly into retreat, you know, by then. So I think that part of it is just that you see people who even sometimes who had like good laudable anti-imperialist instincts, uh, any kind of like real left politics was so um, fringe at that time, right? That when they were presenting their case, right, to, to the broader public, you know, they, they would present it in a very pragmatic um, way that like somebody like Hitchens would, you know, could like have this reaction where it's like, well, what the hell, man, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound like the anti-imperialism I know. That just sounds like isolationism. Right. Uh, that was, uh, yeah. I mean, you even have that with like socialist figures like Peter Camejo, who were increasingly, uh, you know, you know, you know, the guy who wanted the, the, the Trop Maoist detente in the Green Party is also like increasingly by the 90s, a figure who's seen as just like a figure of an old socialist left who's just made capitulations to the kind of new post Cold War uh, protest movementism of the time. And um, again, like what people re- rediscovered Peter Comejo now, but they don't know this trajectory because mm-hmm. this was a very abysmal trajectory. I actually also think it plays out in modern politics because. Um, yeah, I mean, by, by, speaking, by the end of, by the end of Comejo's, you know, life, he was like running an investment, uh, you yeah, know, exactly. like, like there was like, there was like, these were like the ethical investments. Like that's, that's pretty, uh, you yeah, know, that's, yeah, that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty dismal, uh, that's a pretty yeah. dismal trajectory. Like, um, or Jim Kwan, who was a leader of a radical Maoist split off in in San Francisco, who becomes like the the kind of you know by by Occupy the neoliberalish mayor of Oakland. I mean, it's it, uh, uh, Rob Reich uh, crazily had ties to the uh, he was like one step removed from the RCP. Um, that's wild to me, but like. So, I mean, I think people need to look at this for why it felt like the socialist politics was so discredited because yeah. it had been capitulated into the Clinton night, uh, you know, milieu. And and that's it's hard to remember that world now. And, and I have to put myself back in it because I, I came out, you know, my radicalization moment was uh, was Seattle. And my mm-hmm. de-radicalization moment was Seattle the next day. Like, it was, like, pretty much that quick. Um, and and it really – I really get de-radicalized, though, honestly, uh, and, and report the paleoconservative movement during the anti-war movement in the South in particular because of uh, the way a lot of the student left was behaving, and they also didn't really show up, like – Mm-hmm. Um, they were very intimidated by uh, post-war and terror um, policies, which, to be fair, they probably should have been. But, sure. Um, and uh, these Pat Buchanan people uh, are, are these libertarian people, and, and, and a mixture of both in my case, uh, were out there. Um, and, and Hitchens was weirdly like part of that milieu because I recognize his critiques of the Democrats, of their of welfare reform, stuff that like even even milk toast slate readers would know now, mm-hmm. but those same people supported it at the time. And I, oh, I, I think that's been like there's a memory hole around that. And I think it explains why Hitchens is such a hard figure for us to categorize. And unfortunately, I also think the new atheist bit erases a lot of it because mm-hmm. we don't remember Hitchens, the political commentator. Uh, as much, um, except for the last bits of the war on terror, where he's like the the you know seen as like the secular, him and and Sam Harris are the secular justifiers of uh, of Bush policy. Yeah, no, absolutely. I I think um, you know 
yeah, I mean, again, you know, one of the reasons I, I wanted to, uh, to, to write about him, uh, was to, uh, to, to rehabilitate, you know, the, the first, you know, three decades, uh, of his, uh, of his political commentary, uh, which, you know, or whatever, two decades, uh, which are almost entirely pretty solid in the nineties is transitional, you know, but like, there's lots of good stuff there. Um, that, uh, that, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's, I think that's absolutely, um, you know, I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and, you know, and I do want to go back to something you said earlier, which is important, which is that like in a weird way, like both like Chomsky and Hitchens are trying to orient themselves in this post cold war world um, that, that just feels fundamentally different. And, um, and I think this is, you know, this is a big part of, of how, uh, you know, Hitchens, you know, ends up where he ends up on, um, on the war on terror, you know, like, which is, which is a result of a long trajectory. Uh, Cause uh, he, you know, it, it doesn't like, there's this sort of thing that like, if you're just kind of paying attention to the greatest hits, there's this narrative that sounds reasonable that it's just like, I don't know, he was like too into atheism that made him afraid of Muslims. And like, that's why he ended up becoming a hawk. Uh, but then think, okay, well, hold on. Uh, the first war where he, you know, with one exception that was a very brief exception earlier, right? Like the first war where like in any sort of sustained way, he's like really letting go of his, his anti-imperialism or at least making a big exception to it is Bosnia, mm-hmm. you know, which, you know, where the U S is intervening on behalf of Bosnia Muslims against Serbian Christians. Uh, and then again, you know, same deal for, for Kosovo, and then, you know, Kosovo Albanians uh, later in the, uh, later in the decade, you know, before the, before any war that involves, you know, Muslims on the, um, on the enemy side, right? So I don't, I don't think that's it, right? I mean, I think that the, uh, I think that a big part of of what's going on there is that, you know, if you go back and look at the stuff that Hitchens is focused on in like the seventies when he's writing his Cyprus book, uh, the eighties when he's already, and you know, seventies he's already obsessed with Henry Kissinger, you know, the uh, the eighties uh, when he's writing a lot about uh, Central America, like a lot of what he's uh, a lot of what gets him really hot and bothered when he's, he's writing about you know, American foreign policy, which is like, you know, the, the main kind of thing that he's interested in. Uh, interestingly enough, by the way, uh, according to Victor Navasky's uh, article that he wrote after Hitchens died, when Hitchens first came over to work for the nation, like on an ongoing basis, he'd had, uh, he'd been, in the U S for like a year as part of like the exchange program between the nation and the new statesman. But then we decided to stay and they were trying to figure out what he would do. Uh, there was an idea that was thrown around that he would like be, uh, he would be doing this call about wall street, uh, which, uh, which, which is a fascinating, what might've been, you know, cause if, uh, if writing about economics all the time, might've kept him more grounded. I would, I don't know, but, uh, but in any case, I mean, I think um, like, the Hitchens, who who was a savage critic of American foreign policy in the seventies and eighties, and you know, again, transitioned into the nineties, uh, was was really focused more than anything on American support for you know death squads and authoritarian um, right wing regimes uh, in places like Central America, and you know, then like in the nineties, right, uh, and do and then accelerated after 9-11, you know, like who is the U S fighting wars against, right? I mean, it's not like, you know, the Viet Cong, right. It's, it's, it's Slobodan Milosevic. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's the Taliban, you know, like, like these, these are, you know, these are, I mean, I think his conclusion is completely wrong, but I mean, this, this part is, is, is right as far as it goes. Right. I mean, like these, these aren't like the kinds of forces that the United States had by and large been fighting wars against in the seventies and eighties, right? These are in fact, very much like, and in some cases literally are the forces the United States was supporting in that time period. Yeah. And I think, I, you know, I'm honestly uh, to end off on contemporary things, I think you see a, a similar difficulty now in wars that the United States is not uh, directly involved in, but it's very much indirect. Right. 
um, where the correct line, uh, uh, the, a correct campus line does make you feel like you're either picking sides uh, for NATO or for yeah, the Russian right. Federation, and, and neither one, to, to my eyes, looked particularly appealing. No. Um, <laughs> and I do see actually an attempt by people who are totally removed from the Cold War, to be honest. Like, we're talking now, you know, two generations out um since the, since 1992 uh who whose instincts i think are somewhat informed by nostalgia for it uh, both on the far left and the right uh. um uh and uh i think it's it, the reason why i find this interesting right now is i think in this um post bernie moment or at least post bunny 2020 moment yeah um we have a left that similarly has no idea what the hell it's what, what how, how it's supposed to orient itself totally. and what it's supposed to do yeah um probably it, prob yeah. probably post post bernie i mean we were arguing about this on twitter a little bit <laughs> right, earlier, right. but, I, don't, but I, I don't uh about how we would feel if it happened again in 2024 but if we're going to make empirical predictions i think you know probably not right uh you know, like it's most likely Sleepy Joe will run again and lose. You know, um, but uh, yeah, to whom we don't know. But right, yeah, um, right, right. I sometimes think Trump's actually, for all the fear of Trump, I like Trump's maybe the better option because uh -huh. he is immensely unpopular still, except for amongst his base. He's just more popular than Sleepy Joe. Um, uh. The the, uh, the 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 worst case scenario is you get someone truly more even more charismatic than DeSantis. I mean DeSantis charisma is particularly limited. Um uh uh and yeah, the other you, thing I, yeah you, go ahead. yeah you get somebody who'd be a worse Trump. Yeah uh which you know I mean whatever. I mean at, at this point it would, it would take something pretty bad to surprise me about 2024. But uh I would I would say so I I don't know if you saw it. I I wrote an article for uh Sublation uh mm. called uh Ukraine and the Spectre of Christopher Hitchens uh, where I, I basically, you know, basically take a bunch of progressive and, you know, soft left kind of people, some of whom I really like, uh, to, mm -hmm. to task for sounding a whole, like, just for sounding unsettlingly like late Hitchens, you know, when they, uh, when they talk about, you know, the war in Ukraine. Oh, yeah. I, I have, I have definitely felt like, like if for all the people who hate Hitchens now and would still claim to hate him have <sighs> taken similar stances on the Ukraine in ways that I think, uh, and and I say this as a person who does not take the Russian side sure. either, sure. Um, yeah. yeah, but um, but who does see how the geopolitics of of NATO and EU intervention led to this point? Um, whether or not it's the solely explain, you know, well, which which is also like a weird thing to me because, like, um, you know, we could argue about some of those claims, but like, there is this. I mean, that's one of the. I actually, I don't even get into that in the article, but I mean, like, like that. That's something that's driven me crazy uh, in the last few months. That like, if you suggest that there's anything that could have been done differently you know, leading up to it that would have made this less likely to happen. Like, you, know, you make a causal claim, right, about why things got to this point. Like, that's taken as a, as a normative claim, as a justification, you know, for, uh, for, for Putin invading Ukraine, which reminds me of nothing so much as being told, you know, and of course, you know, late Hitchens was saying this louder than anybody, right, you know, being told, uh, in uh, post 9/11, right? That if you uh, that if you thought that there was any sort of like causal explanation of uh, of why it had happened, that had to do with American foreign policy, you know, that it wasn't just that they terrorists hate our freedom, then you know, then you must not really be against you know massacring office workers, you know, in uh, in Manhattan, you know, you must really be uh, you must really be justified it, you know, which, which, yeah, which, which absolutely yeah. drove me nuts. But I mean, I do want to go back to your larger point because I think it's important that um, I do think that, you know, post Bernie, uh, that there, there is an incredible disorientation, um, you know, and even if it's more shallow in some ways than the post Cold War or disorientation, I mean, like it's, it's, it's not good, you know, that uh, on, on the left now. Um, and, and I think part of what we're, you know, seeing, with 
uh, left takes on Ukraine is maybe a kind of fracturing of um, of the sort of uh, you know of a kind of coalition that maybe was brought together you know by the by the Bernie runs for for president and other things that were happening around it, right? In other words, that like that you know. I mean, just as a kind of crude, like, uh, I don't know, uh, like, device, you know, you know, like kind of device for categorizing people. I mean, I sort of think of like, okay, there are people who are Bernie people in the way that like somebody who reads Jacobin is a Bernie person. And there are people who are Bernie people in the way that like the guy who has the Bernie 2016 sticker on his bumper uh, right next to the Obama 2012 sticker on his bumper you know, is a, is a birdie person, um, you know, and never, and never really saw a contradiction between the two. And obviously once you get up to the level of like media people, it's usually not quite as, you know, incoherent as that, but like, um, you know, but there are people, including people I really like, you know, who, who are, um, who are just like <sighs> instinctively are people who sort of see everything through the prism of kind of agreeing with standard American liberals on everything, but kind of like attaching something more left wing to that. And I think that that's, that's who you've seen. um, You know, that's who you've seen like sound start to get, you know, very Hitchensy on Ukraine, although not just them, honestly. Right. I mean, there are people, there are people who, Overall, I would think of as being a little better than that, you know, who, who have also like, like, you know, uh, you know, Matt Dust, right. I mean, like that's, that's, uh, that guy is, is probably about as close to, um, you know, to having a sort of generally anti-imperial view as you're likely to get in the sort of, you know, world of people who are taken seriously and, you know, in like, you know, DC foreign policy circles. Uh, and he's, you know, I mean, he's been extremely late Hitchensy in some of his pronouncements about Ukraine. Yeah, it's been a, uh, it's been, it's been odd to watch. Um, uh, and and honestly, I mean, we also have had the other the other side where people have taken what I like to call the critical support for Al Qaeda. Uh, <laughs> for, for those of you who know, that's a reference to a spart line in the and in, in the anti-war period. Um, stance on, on on russia which is basically russia has done nothing wrong and also it's a militarily brilliant and also it will bring in communism even though that isn't its stated goal at all um and and, and i'm being the unfair of stated, stated yeah, yeah, actually yeah. explicitly the opposite of the stated goal. um i'm being unfair uh but i have seen it where yeah. and it puts people like me in a weird place because i'm always like no i i i don't think putin is actually being totally irrational, I, I do think that beeline for Kiev was dumb, but um, sure. But I also don't. I can't. I. I this is. A, this seems like a war where there is not a clear good side to campusly take, yeah. and I feel like that was like most of the '90s actually for a lot of conflicts, and I don't think that was true during the Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, no, I mean, like, I wasn't wanting the Taliban to win. Sure. Uh, but but a broker piece with the Taliban, I think everybody has known has been inevitable since, like, the middle of the Obama administration, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was botched by both Trump and by, by Biden. I mean, it's a pretty continuous botch. But... Yeah. Uh, different ways, I mean, give... give very give, different ways, but you know, but still. Give, you know... I mean, I, I still, I'm actually still kind of in shock that, uh, that Biden was, uh, willing to tear off that bandaid and stick to it. You know, that seemed like exactly the kind of thing he would not do. Yeah. Which is, you know, like everything else such as, uh, uh, floating for giving student loans. And now it seems like they're just going to perpetually push back any decision forever. Ooh. Um, uh, so uh, yeah. No, you, no, yeah. No. I. I. I mean. Look. There are certainly people on on the Western left who. You know. I mean. I tend to think they're a lot more fringe than the first group, mm-hmm. but they certainly exist. Uh, there's. Um, 
I, I, I think battling the battling the pro NATO, battling the unequivocally weird pro NATO people is actually of a higher priority than yeah, because 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 they're because they just have so much less influence and like um, I just I just sort of I mean I guess I don't know it's it's a little hard for me to tell like I don't know like how what kind of reach does like the gray zone have? I don't really know. Right. But, yeah. Like, no, I don't think anyone knows. So. But... I mean, I, you, you do have, it does have a, a, a strangely significant amount of money. Yeah. Um, and it does, uh, and it, it, it does have, uh, you know, a Blumenthal, which yeah. is that that's a wild irony of history, but it, does it have a lot of of fan? No, I, I really, I and a lot of people who make it like the number one thing, like yeah. issue on the left right now. I don't totally agree with. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it it just seems like if nothing else, look, we're at a time when um, there are, like, I think this at least maybe quieted down a little bit, but like right after the invasion, there were polls where like three quarters of Americans, you know wanted a no-fly zone in Ukraine, which is essentially just an outright pro-World War III position. Yeah, this uh, is, let's have a nuclear war. That's yeah. what that is. Yeah, exactly, right? So, uh, and, you know, and, and we're, like, and look at everything that's happened, right? I mean, that, like, you know, corporate America under, you know, encouragement from the government just kind of, like, rolled over and, like, you know, just casually, like it was just rolling over and crushing it in its sleep, like ended the existence of this entire news network, you know, right? RT America. Uh, that's, that's just, that's just gone now. You know, that there's, um, it's, it's a very like, it was a sketch news network, but it is, it, they did just get rid of it. And it, it is actually telling to me, actually, uh, when you think about it, um, not to get into the politics sure, of sure. what state media is okay or not. Sure. Because, uh, there's a lot of state media we, we we don't do that sort of thing with at all. I mean, I'm not just talking about the BBC either. I mean, right, like, right. um, uh, I I was I was actually shocked by how quickly they made RT go away. Um, I was shocked. I was shocked by by the sanctions, and I've been a little bit shocked on actually also what they won't do. Um, uh, and I've been. I've been extremely taken aback by how virently pro-war parts of the European press are, although in fairness, yeah. closer. Sure. I get sure. it. But, but, uh, no, like fair, you, fair, fair, fair enough. I mean, look to, right, uh, to, but, to, 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 to obliquely reference somebody I actually like quite a bit. Right. I mean, like, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a pass for airing too side on the uh on uh for airing too far on that side if you live in slovenia you know that if you live in the united states right um you know but um, or if you live in finland or or sweden i, sure, get, sure. I get it more than the, even the uk although the uh as a side note the uk's press has been even more bloody uh, and, and bombastic than the us's so it's been weird um yeah, right. Like, and, and so I guess I just think, like, in that kind of atmosphere, right? I mean, like, that the, um, I mean, the, I mean, Jesus, the, uh, was it the International Cat Federation said that, like, they're not going to allow any cat that was bred in Russia, you know, to, uh, to, to compete, you know? The, uh... yeah, it so it reminds me of the weird backlash <laughs> against France in, like, 2001, 2002. Yeah, actually. yeah. Exactly. No, like... what it reminds me. Of. Uh, yeah, that's that. That's that. That stuff is ridiculous. Uh, people who like are mad at Dostoevsky and Tolstoy are. Yeah, uh, I'm still gonna do film streams on Tarkovsky. I, I don't care that he's like. Yeah, like, and that's and that's the thing. Like, so I think in that kind of extremely, you know, jingoistic atmosphere, I do put a higher priority on uh, criticizing, um, you know, this, you know. The, you know the pro NATO left uh, than uh, than the the pro Russia left. Uh, even aside from the fact that even within the left, this, the latter is much more marginal. But like you know, also look. I mean, I think that the you know I I I think that people who are like really doing Putin apologetics right now. I mean, that's like I mean I I just think of as deeply unpleasant weirdos, right? I mean, like this is uh, the, you know, I mean if 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 anything, right? I mean, this is a time when you should be saying like. Hey, um, guys, let's look into the mirror here, like, and, and draw some lessons about, uh, 
you know, U.S. foreign policy, right? Like, I love seeing the American press uh, discover in the last few months that uh, dropping cluster bombs on cities is a war crime. You know that. Uh, and just to remember that, yeah. You know, um, like <laughs> that's you know. So it's like, I would like to, you know, I mean, like, I think if anything, the line on, the, you know, I mean, look, I mean, my, you know, simple-minded position on this is that. Uh, is is that I more or less feel about the invasion of uh, of Ukraine the way I felt about the uh, the invasion of Iraq, which is to say it's really bad and I was against it, but also I wouldn't have particularly wanted like Russia or China to you know to uh, to to get um, to you know enter into to this like kind of trajectory where it becomes increasingly more directly involved in a war against the United States, you know, because because I don't you know I think World War Three would be really bad. Yeah. Oh no. I. I mean, honestly, even for stuff like world world hunger, um, yeah, a, a brokered priest is is absolutely necessary, and it will. And a brokered priest that any side would accept uh, would require NATO to change some strategic orientation, and for both Russia and and the West to eat crow, like right. both sides would have to eat crow. And I, I don't know if we're there yet. And uh, unfortunately, not to get real dark, I hope that what takes us to get there is not someone nuking a city or even someone Grozniing a city, because uh, right. that's another thing that has not yet right. happened um, that I was actually pretty afraid of happening <laughs> like a couple, like six or eight or eight weeks ago. The, the, uh, but I do think this this tells us where how lost the orientation is. I actually don't know that the left knows how to deal with um, its relationship to the Democrats. And I think that's actually very similar mm -hmm. to 2001, where mm -hmm. the left was coming out of being very ambivalent about its relationship to the Clinton uh, administration and to the Clinton Democrats and to, new, and to the new Democrats since like 1984. Um, and yet not really knowing where it could go uh, other than, a, a, and in some ways it was actually rectified by the anti-war posture because right. that gave it a clear coherent action that it did not really have during say the anti-globalization movement or, or this, that, and the other, or during the period of new labor. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're kind of entering a similar period again. Like, I don't know that we, I think, I think the left sort of detente with the Biden administration and, and a lot of us, not me, cause I'm generally an ultra and you know this about me, sure. this, this, uh, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> to use a slur for myself, yeah, yeah. um, but a lot of us, I think thought that Biden was at least going to attempt more Right. than he did because of his immediate posture during COVID and the early COVID relief bill and this like discussion of like basically like something like a, a new neo Fordism, which is still according to me not very good, but it's way sure. better than than neoliberalism happening. And, and and we're not it's not like we've gotten neoliberalism either. It's like we've gotten nothing. Like a big nothing burger of nothingness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, and, and look, I mean, I, I had, um, I mean, it's funny because I had like on the, on the one hand, you know, I can't at least, you know, I, I don't really think you get that many points for this, but I mean, I can't at least, you know, accurately claim to have, have uh, you know, have seen it coming, right? I mean, I, I had a, um, uh, an article in Jacobin, I think that was that came out on inauguration day, uh, where I definitely said this, and I, I think what also. So I wrote an article about Biden for Jacobin. Uh, it was like about Biden winning, but I wrote it before the election. Like somebody wrote a Trump wins, Trump wins article. I don't know who did that, you know. And and I wrote a Biden wins article, and uh, and and they 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 put it out like you know, five minutes after they announced the election result finally. And like in those articles, I said, look, I don't actually think he's going to do any of this stuff. Right. You know, that, that he, that he's saying like on any of the like stuff on, that's like on the like Biden Harris campaign website. That's like, you know, maybe not what we want, but is like at least a, you know, positive step, you know, free community college and public option and all that stuff. Right. 
I don't really think he's going to do any of that stuff because, because look, I mean, Obama said he was going to do some of the same stuff, right? I mean, like look at, you know, uh, card check, right? You know, that the, so like I've seen this movie before, right? You know, but uh, despite having said that, and despite having said like, um, like when they first split off, you know, build back better for the infrastructure bill, I put out an article saying, look, guys, I don't care how many people who are in pos- important positions say they're only going to vote for, you know, that they won't vote for the infrastructure bill if Build Back Better doesn't happen first. It's just painfully obvious that, you know, the whole port of splitting it off is so you can sacrifice Build Back Better and just do the infrastructure bill, right? I mean, like this is, again, we've seen this movie before. It's like all of the Democrats uh, who promised that they wouldn't vote for Obamacare if it didn't have a public option. Uh, so I said all that, but I have to admit, even having said all that, right, I wasn't like, you know, super duper confident that, 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 you know, that like all of those, all that dismal stuff was going to come true. I mean, like there were definitely points where I was like, oh, I guess maybe some of the stuff is happening. Who knows? Right. You know, let's, let's see. And then, and then it was, you know, even though it's what I thought would happen, right. Like what I, like, it was still a little surprising, just like the, the sheer scale and tonnage of the nothing that happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it, it's it, it's even less than what I expected from the Obama lessons. Like, because I at least thought some of the things they were going to say were were pressing enough. Um, particularly with the with the likelihood of an inflation uh, inflation coming, but they tr- tried to ignore that, try to paint it as just temporary supply chain. Now it's you know. Anyway, there's the whole lot of issues that uh, it, it's going to look like the Biden administration proceeded on the biggest Medicare rates hike in history. Did nothing about student loans whatsoever. Did nothing about. Uh, the the decaying medical infrastructure and did very little about infrastructure in general and mostly tried to turn a sideshow that about January 6th uh, into something that most people have forgotten about. It's going to be undone by conservative judges anyway. And lastly uh, did nothing about the Supreme court at a time in which it actually mattered. Um, That's kind of a, that's a Herbert Hoover levels of failure. I mean, no, it, it absolutely is. And I mean, the fact that they're, um, uh, it, yeah, I mean, that the, that you have the fact that right now they're trying to like, whatever, I mean, um, uh, Nathan Robinson has an article in, uh, in current affairs where he, he says this, I think very well. I mean, there are a couple things he says there that I disagree with, but I think that the gist of the article is absolutely right. You know, which, which is like, it's insane that right now the Democrats like announce strategy is to like try to do a big PR push to like get voters to focus on January 6th, which is like, okay. Um, this thing that was bad that happened a year and a half ago that by the way, I mean, you know, the sort of people who were immediately involved had the, had the book thrown at them already. Uh, that's, uh, but like most importantly, it's it's not. Um, I mean, it's it's just a pretty astonishing exercise, right? Because you're saying like, no, uh, you know, we understand that the voters don't care about this, but I think we'll be able to make them care if we if we push it hard enough, right? You right. know that like <laughs> even stuff like Roe v. Raid, they can't seem to get a clear messaging on because they're also trying to push pro life. Uh... Uh, candidates in South Texas. So like it's, it's there. It, it, it seems like the, the Democrats have nothing really at all. Um, and, uh, and, and what it's fascinating to me when occasionally Democrats will, will push back on me on this. And I'm like, but you have now you don't have a supermajority like you had in, in 2008 to 2010. However, historically, that hadn't happened much period ever like like that was not common since the 60s um uh so so the fact you guys blew that back then is a big deal but you're a different group of democrats yeah. except most of you aren't but those of you who are new i guess um, i mean i mean there's also there's also stuff like i mean it's complicated cuz look are there things that you can legitimately 
you know, blame on, you know, mansion and cinema. Oh, and really, for, sure. There, for sure. There there are, right? You know, but like there's also a lot that Biden could just do. Right. I mean, like like the student loan thing is a perfect example. I mean, like that's that's you know, like that's something he could just do. He has like pretty publicly considered just doing it. Right. right. You and, know? and said and said he was gonna just do it and then seems to just be backing off of it without I mean and, and also as a as a strategy, he'd have better just as an electoral strategy, he should have just said nothing. Right. Than to <laughs> raise the possibility of not doing it. Yeah. it. Um, raise the possibility in a way. I mean, I, I don't want to sound conspiratorial, but raise the possibility in a way that sounds like he was waiting for like the New York Times to talk him out of it, right? Like, um, and I, I, I do think, you know, I also think it, you've seen a lot of the posturing around uh, around racial issues change on the Democrat Democratic Party as well, because I mean, their voter base, their only marked increase in a voter race at all in 2020 in aggregate was suburban white men. Like that's, that's the the net gain. Like that's the people who voted for them in a, in a, in a larger proportion than they have historically had. And that's probably not going to be. So I mean, mean, it it is pretty amazing how dramatic the swings have been, right? Like, especially in the, like, especially if you take like the last few decades as a whole, right. I mean, like we, we sort of, uh, you know, that like there is this sort of long, slow transition from like super predators to kneeling in kente cloth. Uh, and, um, and now, you know, I don't think they're going to overcorrect all the way back to super predators, you know, but they're, they're, um, you know, but I think they're definitely backing off of that. Right. I mean, like, uh, you know, Biden had the whole slab against defund the police in the state of the union. Uh, there was, uh, you know, and, and the, yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of like the idea, um, you know, the, you know, the idea that, and, and look, there are a lot of things you could criticize about the way criminal justice reform is like framed as a purely racial issue or whatever, but like given that it is, right, they have, um, it's, that's something that, you know, there was a lot of professed enthusiasm for in 2020, even going into 2020, 2021, uh, among a lot of Democrats. Uh, I don't know. I'm thinking about like Elizabeth Warren at the DNC speaking in front of the like uh, the building blocks that spelled out BLM, right? And um, and now, you know, yeah, now they're definitely correcting away from that. You know, since um, you know. There's there's been a little spike in crime. I mean, not even that much, but I mean, like enough to you know, I mean, a, a, enough to to um, to retoxify, you know, a lot of a lot of that positions, especially if you know, especially if you're, you know, especially if you want to consolidate those gains in the suburbs. Yeah, it's uh, it's a, it's it's a sad situation, and I guess you know we, we've moved away from from Hitchens, but I, I just want to reemphasize the point. It Weird stuff happens in these points of transition. Um, and I would not be surprised if things cut... Uh, I think the word realignment is always overused, but if things cut in particularly strange ways in mm-hmm. the future. I think we've already seen that with, with some former allies turning right-ish very quickly, but... Um, uh, I, I think there might be a, a lot more of it or, or, and, and not in predictable ways. Like there might even be, I, well, there already is different ways in which people can turn rightish, um, are outright right wing as these things settle down. And I, I do think the left is the American left in particular, but I think also the British left is saddled with this too. Um, is how do you redefine yourself? after your guy loses and, and popularizes something actually in the broader culture, but mm-hmm. in which doesn't seem to be strongly represented in the party that they were operating in. I mean, this right. is even, I think this is more dramatic in, in, in labor than it is in, uh, uh even with, uh, the socialist left, because that, you know, it's not like, it's not like the squad took over the DNC, right. but, uh, um, 
And it also seems more weird what they're running off of, too. I, I literally saw an ad. I, I mentioned this today, but I saw an ad for labor in the UK talking about Black Lives Matter and the Ferguson protests. Yep. <laughs> and like, 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 OK, I, I get like you, you could have British Black Lives Matter and but. But why Ferguson and Floyd that that does not have like it's it, I can't imagine that has a lot of purchase on even the, the British left. So uh, yeah, I, I I feel like there's we're we're we might be in a weird period for a while. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, thank you for coming on. Um, uh, of course, check out the uh, the book. I'll also link that article that you wrote at Sublation since it's uh, newer. Anything else you'd like to plug? Uh, yeah, let's see. So I think that's um, I think that is when's this coming out? A week. A week. Okay. Uh, now let's let's just leave it at that. So uh, the book, the article, uh, give them an argument is on uh, on YouTube on Monday nights at eight Eastern, and we should be restarted by the time this comes out. Sweet. All right. Let's let's all have a good night, and I hope you. Uh, I hope nothing eventful happens between when we recorded this and when this airs. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> all right.